Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this book discussion. This evening, we will present a conversation on the issues raised in one of Orion Blackstone's recent publications, Eastward Hope, India's Relations with the Indo-Pacific. Part of our strategic studies series, this book studies the critically important issues of India's relations with the countries lying to its east, especially in light of recent political events that have sparked the country's interest in the past two years, and which our esteemed panelists will be discussing in greater detail during the course of the evening. The contributors to this volume, all specialists in their respective fields, focus on the security concerns and rivalries connected to the economic and strategic rise of China, combined with the need for increased economic integration in the region. The volume explores the economic and political consequences of this growing Asian integration, China's constantly changing and evolving perception of India, and India's emerging relations with the important nations of Japan and Korea. Strategic relations with and tussles over the neighboring states of Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Nepal form an equally important part of the volume as to India's developing relationships with countries of Southeast Asia, such as Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Now, before we move on to today's discussion, I would like to briefly introduce our panelists and extend a very warm welcome to each of them. The discussion will be chaired by Professor Harshvi Pan, who is also the editor of the Strategic Studies series. He is a professor of international relations at King's College London, and is director of research and head of the Strategic Studies program at Observer Research Foundation, New Delhi. He is also honorary director of the Delhi School of Transnational Affairs at Delhi University. Professor E. Sridharan, the editor of the volume under discussion today, is the academic director and chief executive of the University of Pennsylvania Institute for the Advanced Study of India, New Delhi. He's a political scientist who has published extensively on both Indian politics and international relations, and is the editor-in-chief of the academic journal, India Review. Professor Madhu Palla is a former professor of Chinese studies at the Department of East Asian Studies, Delhi University. She has also taught at the Jawaharlal Nehru University and Queen's University, Canada, has held a visiting fellowship at Sudan University, Shanghai, and been a visiting scholar at the University of Sichuan at Chengdu. She is a member of the China Core Group at the Indian Council of World Affairs, New Delhi. She has served on the governing bodies of Delhi University's constituent colleges, been on the executive council of the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, New Delhi, and is currently on the advisory council of three new China centers. She is also currently editor of India Quarterly. Professor C. Raja Mohan is director, Institute of South Asian Studies, National University of Singapore. He is one of the leading commentators on India's foreign policy. He has been associated with a number of think tanks in New Delhi, including the Center for Policy Research and the Observer Research Foundation. He writes a regular column for the Indian Express and was earlier the strategic affairs editor for the Hindu Chennai. He is on the editorial boards of a number of Indian and international journals on world politics. A very warm welcome to you, professors, and thank you very much for being a part of this panel today. May I now request Professor Harsh Pan to start the evening's discussion. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Prabhupada. It was, uh, it's always a pleasure to be here with such distinguished academics and thinkers. Uh, let me also take this opportunity to welcome you all uh, for this very special event uh, this evening, uh, the launch of this latest offering from the Strategic Studies series uh, at Orion Black Swan. For the last few years, uh, we have been curating some of the more interesting works on Indian foreign policy, security policy, as well as regional security, uh, as part of this broader series. So we have had a number of publications over the last few years that deal with, with a range of topics in this area. And we have published both uh, young voices, upcoming voices, as well as established scholars in an attempt to explore uh, new ideas, concepts, and empirical realities that are shaping the strategic environment around them, which is changing uh, so very rapidly every single day. I'm 
and therefore it is with great pleasure that uh, we are launching this very, very important book uh, and a volume, Eastward Ho, India's Relations with the, with the Indo-Pacific, uh, expertly edited by uh, Dr. Sridhar. This is particularly important uh, in some ways because this speaks to one of the most interesting uh, and significant uh, developments uh, in, uh, in strategic calculus, in strategic thinking, uh, which is the rise of the geography called the Indo-Pacific and uh, the struggle to define India's place in it. Uh, Indo-Pacific would not be Indo-Pacific without the role that India is playing or India plans to play or others expect India to play in this maritime space. And I think this volume brings together some of the best voices, some of the best researchers on the topic in India on the subject. And therefore this collection speaks to some of the most uh, important issues of our times uh, in, in strategic, uh, both in the strategic community as well as uh, in the academic discourse. And to discuss uh, this book, we have two very distinguished panelists already uh, introduced by the uh, Professor Madhu Bhalla and Dr. Sivaja Mohan. Uh, Professor Kanti Bajpayee was also supposed to be here with us today, but he could not join in the last minute because of some uh, other, uh, event or uh, family uh, issue. But uh, we have a very full panel with us uh, nonetheless. And before I invite the discussants to talk about uh, their uh, interpretation of the book there and, uh, and the views on the book. Let me invite uh, the editor himself, Dr. Sridharan, for his introductory remarks on the book and about the book, situating the book in the wider context uh, of what his other works have been, but perhaps also speaking about some of the other uh, chapters in the volume that speak to this larger issue of the Indo Pacific and India's role in that maritime uh, thing. Sri, floor is all yours. Thank you, Harsh. Uh... Let, let me first thank Orion Black Swan for hosting this event and Arsh as the series editor and the panelists, uh, Professor Balla and Professor Raj Mohan for making time for this event. And of course, all the contributors to the book and all of you for making time for this event, the audience. I uh, will start by saying that the idea for this book actually germinated a long time back uh, when I was coordinating a fellowship program called Asia Fellowships, which was uh, uh, in which involved uh, sending uh, academics from within Asia to other Asian countries for six to nine months. That exchange program actually created a pool of people which, uh, with continuing long-term interest in Asia. And then that evolved into this project, which was very generously funded by the Nawazgai Ratan Tata Trust. And uh, so we have this book uh, looking at this new strategic geography called Indo-Pacific, which has come up in the last few years, and which I have defined for the purpose of this book as East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Eastern Rim of South Asia, leaving aside Pakistan, Afghanistan, and so on. Now, uh, we have a collection of chapters by country specialists uh, looking at India's relations with each of these countries in, the, in a comprehensive way, in the political, diplomatic, strategic, economic aspects of India's uh, evolving relationship ever since the post Cold War period when the uh, India launched its Look East policy in the early 90s, which then became the Act East policy under the present government in 2014. So it's a book uh, which seeks to trace out the evolution in recent history of India's uh, uh, eastward policies and uh, uh, look, covering all these aspects uh, by uh, people who have done field work in each of these countries and were country specialists uh, in a, uh, set in the context of uh, this conscious outreach to uh, East and Southeast Asia, which has been going on from the look East and act East policies. And so we are now in a position, very interesting time uh, now uh, with the uh, rise of China, the assertion of China to assess what are India's options and possible roles in this whole larger context. Now, I want to lead chapter, I'll just lay out the context in which these studies uh, uh, sort of fit in and make, uh, make sense. I argue essentially that the larger political, economic, and strategic context of Asia is defined by two paradoxical situations or a, a paradox. There, is, there are two contradictory tendencies. One is in the last 30 years, led by the rise of China, there has been massive economic integration in Asia such that China has emerged as the largest trading partner of almost all the Asian countries and many of them 
China is the largest trading partner than the US and the European Union, the EU combined. So China has, uh, the uh, growth of the Chinese economy has uh, led to this massive economic integration within Asia, plus the growth of these economies themselves. And that is reflected by and promoted by the rise of free trade agreements uh, from 2000 to the present. Uh, if you count all the bilateral and plurilateral uh, free FTA, free trade agreements within the region, it is about something like 43 if you count the WTO notified and the not yet notified WTO agreements, which culminated uh, in the uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RE's RCEP, uh, which India opted out of last year, which is basically the East Asian Summit countries of 2005, uh, that is excluding the US, uh, uh, 15 countries which have now formed RCEP. So there has been massive economic integration related to and led by the rise of China and not only trade, but also intra-regional uh, FDR, foreign direct investment, which prom promotes trade and is a result of trade. And a sort of the intermeshing of supply chains within the region and out of the region from here. Uh, the second thing which is happening, I mean, uh, is that uh, the, this is the paradox that unlike in the European case, the European Union, where massive economic integration, political integration, the creation of a European Union with increasing uh, supranational institutions and so on. Here, the same rise of China, which led to economic integration across the region, has also led to strategic tensions and rivalries all around the rim of China, from the East China Sea to the South China Sea, to the Indian Ocean, to the line of actual control on the India-China border. So you find China's economic growth is integrating the region, but not producing a political or security consensus. Uh, it is creating security rivalries all around the rim of China. So these are these are contradictions. It's quite opposite to what happened in the case of the EU. Now, in a sense, uh, the economic integration was also, uh, unlike in the EU case, uh, there uh, it is happening without political quota, generally understood to be political prerequisites. That is. In uh, post -world, post World War II Europe, there was a common threat, the Soviet threat, which and the uh, American umbrella, which led to uh, a motivation for both economic integration and subsequently uh, political. There was a political prerequisite. There was strategic NATO was formed before the EU came into being. Uh, the EU in all its various stages. So there was a political uh, 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 and security uh, consensus, which led to economic integration, which led to super. The European Union, you had a very different strategic order in the post World War II period, right up to the beginning of the uh, uh, post World War period in the early 90s. You had a hub and spokes kind of thing where the United States was a security provider for non communist Asia as the hub, and it has the spokes of a wheel. It has separate treaties with Japan, with South Korea, with Australia and New Zealand, and uh, less uh, firm treaties uh, or security understandings with Philippines, Indonesia, Singapore, Taiwan, and so on. So you had a hub and spokes kind of system. You didn't have a security consensus in Asia, but yet you had uh, what in East Asia they called uh, 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 cold politics, but hot economics. You had a massive uh, economic integration, but without security or political integration. Now, in this larger context of this paradox, of massive economic integration, but security rivalries, both linked to the rise of China, what have been India's options in the post-Cold War period from the early, 90, early 90s? India has looked east consciously once it liberalized its economy, looking for new markets, for growth uh, impulses. Uh, and it has uh, tried to uh, form a range of uh, relationships with the ASEAN, the 10-member 10, 10 ASEAN countries, with uh, looking east as it abandoned SARC and went to Pinstec, which spans Myanmar and Thailand, apart from Eastern Rim of South Asia. It has tried to uh, link itself both economically and politically. It, you, politically, you see it, and strategically, you see it, uh, not just in the recent Quad, which has been reactivated, came up in 2007, then went, uh, uh, then basically died a natural death and has been revived. But in the naval exercises, we started with the US Malabar exercises from the early 90s, and then gathering case in the 2000s, uh, uh, you know, uh, bilateral and multilateral naval exercises held in uh, in the you know bay of bengal and in south china sea and sometimes uh, into uh, east china sea now you are having it as we speak 
in the Western Pacific. So uh, you've had an uh, Indian uh, 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 sort of uh, attempt, both under Lukist and Hakkis policies, to increase its influence and its both economic and strategic into the East. And today, in this situation, I mean, the manuscript uh, was basically finalized before the pandemic, before the last year or so. But it's even more topical today, uh, what the book talks about. Given what has happened in the last one year, the China India tension on the LAC, the uh, revival of the Quad, uh, and so on. In the context of the greater assertiveness of China, actually, that assertiveness started uh, the, the sort of uh, from 2011 onwards when they started uh, saying that the not the first island chain, the second island chain is their vital interest. Uh, and they started, uh, and then later on, the BRI, which is a concerted economic and political push to bypass the Malacca problem, to have direct uh, 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 reach out right from Europe in the West to, to Pakistan, to the Arabian Sea, and all so on. So uh, given the Chinese uh, assertiveness, both uh, economic and uh, strategic, what are India's options in this context? How has Indian policy evolved in the post lokist period? And what are its options in this context? Is what all the uh, uh, you know, country specialists in this volume seek to look at in detail in the country by country chapters. But situating it in this larger strategic uh, context of uh, economic integration without security consensus, therefore a flux, a, loop, a sort of open ended situation. Where do we go from here? So this is what the book attempts to deal with, and uh, uh, it is uh, highly uh, topical today, given the development of the past one year, and which is still going on. So I don't want to say uh, more than that, but uh, with that, I'll hand the floor to our esteemed analysts. Thank you. Thanks, Sri. Uh, and uh, let me also uh, remind those uh, who have joined us uh, that there is an invitation in the chat box to send your questions, comments, and observations to insert in our uh, and, uh, we, I think we'll be happy, uh, panelists will be happy to take up some of those issues uh, in the, in the news later on. Uh, but uh, with that introductory remarks uh, by uh, let me invite Professor Bhalla now uh, for her observations, questions, criticisms, uh, and uh, you know, general overview of what she uh, makes of the book, what she makes of the arguments. And also, I think, uh, given that the, what she has said uh, is enormously topical, insofar as where do we situate the larger academic, uh, uh, you know, academic project? Often it is said that academics, you know, they, they take their cue from what is happening in the real world, so they are behind. Uh, you know, it's behind the steps. Shri is arguing that he's uh, he's you know uh, mapping out the, the trends very you know, clearly. So I would uh, you know really uh, look forward to uh, hearing from Professor Bhalla now uh, about the book uh, and about the wider argument that it makes. You are muted. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. Um, I must say uh, it's a great pleasure to read something that has come together as a consolidated sort of discussion on our look east and act east policy. Uh, generally, one gets uh, you know little bits and pieces of papers here and there, uh, but um, I think what uh, is remarkable about this book is actually the introduction, where uh, Professor Sridharan has actually raised the two questions that run through the book. Right. The one being, uh, does economic integration make uh, the Indo-Pacific more secure? And uh, the secondly, does uh, secu do security relationships make uh, economic integration more uh, possible, more plausible? Right. Uh, and I think uh, both these questions sort of run through the chapters in the book, um, which is quite interesting um, because. Uh, in some ways, I think that uh, generally we have been on the whole discussing the Act East policy and the Look East policy before that, um, as uh, reaching out to bilateral partners, looking at the Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, defining a vision for the Indo-Pacific, uh, but not specifically at how this thing works out. What exactly is going to happen in the Indo-Pacific that will integrate the Indo-Pacific, allow us to play a role in the Indo-Pacific, India to play a role in the Indo-Pacific? Uh, in Indo and um, what are the um, 
what are the implications of all of that? What are the ramifications of this? What are the implications of this? Who are we going to partner with? And who is willing to partner with us and have us in the Indo-Pacific as a central player? I think all of these issues come through in the book very nicely. So at the outset, I think it's a, it's a very good sort of menu of chapters and discussions on many, many of the states around the Indo-Pacific, in South Asia and in the Indo-Pacific and in East Asia. Right. Um, the, the interesting part, of course, is that what also comes through in many of these chapters is that the Look East policy was really more about this economic outreach, was really more about getting into the ASEAN, signing at the FTAs, um, extending uh, trade and uh, FTIs. Uh, whereas the Look Act, uh, sorry, the Act East policy is really much more concerned with strategic issues. We tried some strategic uh, conversations uh, during the Look East policy. Not many of them came through. As you said, you know, as uh, Professor Sweden said, the Quad as an idea was um, a nascent idea at that time fell through and never actually came into being. But I think the Quad as an idea has become a very dynamic, livable idea now and very uh, concrete in terms of the, its definition of what it sees as uh, strategically valuable in the Indo-Pacific. So in, in a sense, I think the difference, the difference between the Look East and the Act East is very, very clear to me. And even through most of the discussions that you know, come, throughout, come through the uh, various chapters, it seems that um, the chapters are more or less equally divided on what happened during the Look East and what is now happening during the Act East. So there is a kind of uh, a dichotomy between the economic dis discussions on the economic integration and the discussions on the strategic issues today. Um, so that, that's uh, fairly clear to me when I read that book. Um, the interesting part, of course, is I think the introduction sort of lays out in many ways the dilemmas both of economic integration as well as of security integration. Uh, and it also lays out, I think, the possibilities of um, uh, how this could be done, uh, looking at previous examples, say in Europe, for example, hegemonic stability, coalition uh, theory, et cetera, all of that, right? But I think it also comes to the conclusion in some ways that neither of these, uh, uh, these theories actually explain what is happening in the Indo-Pacific. I think the fact that uh, none of the Indo-Pacific states are willing today to accept a hegemon in the Indo-Pacific um, uh, this is discounting, of course, as, uh, the U.S. as a non-resident uh, uh, power, um, uh, makes the situation all the more complicated. And I think the rise of China and the kind of implications of China's rise, strategic implications of China's rise, um, don't make Indo-Pacific nations very comfortable with China's rise, although they hedge their relationship to China because of economic integration and the economic pain it would cost to actually move away from China. So in a, in a sense, I think what we've seen so far is that um, uh, in many ways, uh, the Indo-Pacific does not lend itself to the kind of theorizing that we find in IR uh, about other states, about European states, for example. And I think Amitabh Acharya has very much sort of talked about this at length. So even theoretically and you know, in the academic discourse, this is fairly clear. Uh, at the level of policy also, I think this is very clear. Uh, because if you look at the whole idea of economic integration in, in, um, in uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific, I think economic integration uh, in the sense, uh, while it was ASEAN-centered to begin with, and then China-centered, of course, as China's economic rise happened, um, it rested much more on initially on bilateral agreements to a large extent, right? And the larger FTAs, for example, the India's FTA with the ASEAN came much, much later and other countries' uh, FTAs with the ASEAN came later. So in a sense, I think the bilateral relationships that were established during this period became the grounding for a kind of consensus over economic uh, drivers and over economic directions and that became very significant to the both the debate on economic integration as well as the kinds of aspirations that most countries had including india to economic integration uh, but these were uneasy ftas as well and many of them took many many years to actually be uh, you know signed um, however um, i think the fact that these ftas have now come together in the rcep 
um, has linked uh, uh, economic integration directly, at least in New Delhi's mind, to critical strategic and security issues, um, both in terms of the implications for the economy, as well as in terms of the implications for accepting China as, uh, accepting China as a driving force for integration in the Indo-Pacific. I think that's always an underlying theme as far as our policymakers are concerned to a large extent. So um, in a sense, economic integration itself has been somewhat uneasy, I would say. Uh, the, uh, in the Act East policy, I think uh, uh, the, all the divisions, all the fault lines, I think, have come to the fore. Because here, uh, the primary driver is really the strategic and the security situation as far as New Delhi is concerned. And all of its uh, outreach to various uh, nations across the Indo-Pacific, um, and as, we, and, uh, as Professor Sridharan said, uh, have actually looked at a combination of economic and strategic uh, policy making and strategic agreements. So maritime uh, issues have become a, uh, a major issue. Maritime security has become a major issue. Defense agreements have become a major issue. Uh, defense cooperation has become a major issue. Singapore, for example, South Korea, for example, uh, Tokyo and Japan, for example. Uh, so what we are looking at is a sort of marriage of economic and strategic issues in the Act East policy today, which is why in one sense, Act East policy riles China a great deal more than the Look East policy. Uh, if I remember during the Look East time, they were merely curious about why, what India was doing in Southeast, in Southeast Asia and in East Asia. But with the Act East policy, I think there is a a much finer tone and stronger tone of criticism of India's presence in the Indo-Pacific. So I think we are we are looking really at that. But I, I, I don't think it answers Sridharan's two questions in the introduction. I don't think the book really answers that. What happens if security, what happens to economic integration if security integration happens? And what happens to security integration if economic integration happens. We have clearly seen that when in economic integration has happened, say in the pre previous period, uh, security integration has not, uh, has not devolved from that, has not evolved from that. It is not necessary that countries in the, in the Indo-Pacific see each other's, uh, see their security interests in, uh, in sync with the security interests of China, for example, or with Japan, for example, et cetera, right? So what we are looking at is the fact that uh, we have not yet, I think, tabulated the extent to which it is possible to move and how to move with, from economic integration to security integration. Um, there are general uh, discussions with, within the book, within the chapters in the book on, um, you know, um, strategic uh, interests coming together, strategic agreements and naval agreements and uh, you know, defense agreements and all of that. But I don't think there is a systematic uh, sort of application or of that question to the discussion in each chapter. And I would really much have liked to see that, to see how the chapters actually answer those two questions, right? Um, so we are back actually to square one in, in many of the chapters where we have a discussion of what is happening on the ground, but we really don't have any conclusions that we can draw uh, on the value of economic integration to security integration or security integration to economic integration. And I think that connection is very, very important for us to evaluate and to be actually assess as we go forward. Um, and finally, I think, um, I mean, I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I really want to say that, you know, despite the fact that we talk about India's role in the Indo-Pacific, the Indo-Pacific is actually being shaped by China. It's being shaped by China's interests. It is shaped by China's outreaches. It is being shaped by China's influence and by its economic power. I think there are very few countries, and I think all the discussions in the in the book bring this up. Very few countries that would actually um, tilt away from China economically at the risk of economic pain. And uh, the pandemic has indicated that uh, the level of integration that exists because of the supply chain, the disruptions of supply chains, and therefore the disruptions of national economies, but it has also raised the question of how, um, 
how deep this integration should be, whether uh, supply chains should be changed, whether the direction of supply chains should be changed, whether countries should be breaking away from China. But I do not think really on the ground, uh, whether this last year or the year before that, or since the pandemic, most countries have managed to do that or even wish to do that um, at the cost of extreme economic uh, pain to their economies. So we are looking at the fact that China drives, China shapes, and China influences um, you know, both the visions of the Indo-Pacific, what policies are enacted in the Indo-Pacific, and specifically, I think it shapes India's response both to the Indo-Pacific, other countries in that, and as well in its own neighborhood. Um, but I think the interesting part of this whole Indo-Pacific thing is, and the rise of China and you know, the, you know, India's uh, sort of uh, verbalized uh, interest in the Indo-Pacific, is that middle and smaller powers now have more opportunity to actually shape the policies of larger states. And we see that in South Asia, we see how Nepal, uh, Myanmar, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka uh, are able to actually shape how we respond, how India, how India responds to them. Uh, uh, this, of course, complicates New Delhi's uh, uh, foreign policy position and foreign policies uh, somewhat, to a great deal, in fact. But I think the fact that smaller states and middle states have this ability now to shape and to have large powers respond to them in some ways as they would prefer, um, also constrains to a large extent the way in which larger powers like India and China can take smaller and middle powers for granted. And this makes the whole idea of the Indo-Pacific and the rise of China, you know, all of the uh, geopolitical ramifications of that, much more democratic in many, many ways. Um, and it, it, by giving agency to smaller powers, it brings them into the discussion. So therefore, I think the one of the values of this big value of this book, I think, is a discussion on India's relationship with Vietnam, for example, all of these South Asian states. Uh, India's relationship with Singapore, I think, is one of the most, I think one of the best chapters in the book is actually um, the one that I learned a great deal from was the chapter on India's relationship with Singapore, how Singapore as a city state has facilitated certain ideas of strategic security and economic integration uh, without being having the influence of a large state or even of a middle state. So, uh, you know, the, the, the huge diversity of states and the huge diversity of their responses um, I, I think it's very fascinating. And also I think it should be sort of, it's, it's something I think that Indian policymakers uh, have taken account of, but maybe should take more account of as they move forth in sort of defining this Indo-Pacific vision and their role in it. Thank you. I'm going to end there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bala. And uh, Sri, I think once uh, Dr. Raja Mohan is done, Maybe we can come to you for an initial response to some of the issues that they are raising, uh, and then maybe we can move to open it up. I think one of the most uh, interesting points uh, Professor Bhalla made was that, uh, you know, of course, China is the driver, and China is the driver in the Indo Pacific, but China doesn't like the term Indo Pacific. So, in a sense, this has been a paradoxical situation where other powers have actually driven uh, the logic of the Indo Pacific, whereas the China has been the shaper of the without China. And none of this would have, would have happened. Um, but now that China has achieved that, I think it's uh, the, the middle powers perhaps are more important in shaping uh, some of the architecture around it. Uh, so let me invite uh, Dr. Rajan Mohan now for his uh, observations on the book and his broader comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Harsh. And uh, it's delighted to be part of this uh, panel. So let me begin by congratulating you and uh, Shri for, uh, uh, for this volume. Uh, it's really, I think, this idea of a strategic studies series as well as uh, the focus of this volume on one is what is now easily the most pressing uh, set of issues that confront India. Uh, I think dealing with those, I think it's uh, really a welcome addition to the uh, to the debate. Uh, my own sense is uh, that uh, the I, I would I would want to focus on the you know the, the paradoxes that confront India I mean, as opposed to the larger paradox uh, that. Uh, uh, that she talked about uh, between security uh, tensions and the economic integration that is taking place. So as we look to how does India deal with the challenges that are emerging in the region, uh, there is a paradox. I mean, I think, uh, let me point to that, uh, taking off and flipping the title of the book, uh, Eastward Ho into Westward Ho, uh, that it's actually the biggest change in India's policy, you would say, in the last few years, 
uh, is a growing uh, engagement uh, with the US and the West. Uh, in fact, the book Westward Ho by Charles Kingsley was really a romantic novel about the British romance with the new lands in America uh, that uh, the kind of, you know, Sir Walter Raleigh, Drake, and the whole maritime romance of discovering the United States and, and uh, colonizing, the, colonizing the, the United States. So here it is, the, the paradox that we confront today uh, is that uh, India's engagement I mean, with the East, I mean, as a, as a geographic theater remains the same, we're now calling it the Indo-Pacific, uh, but the, how India engages that is profoundly changed. That is, today we're we are going to engage this region in partnership with the US and the West, and increasingly in opposition to the leading Asian power uh, in the region, that is China. So this is something I think profoundly different. I mean, I think this gets touched upon in the book in different ways, but I think it's important to understand this big shift that is taking place uh, in, uh, in India. Because for nearly a century, I mean, I think uh, since the original Pan-Asianist idea that came at the turn of the 20th century, the principal feature of India's engagement with the East was about keeping a significant political distance from the West, defining an identity as different from the, from the West, uh, they say, go back to Tagore and the whole creation of an of a Asian uh, identity. Uh, and then the anti-colonial solidarity, anti-Western mobilization that was an online movement, and then the post-Cold War emphasis on a multipolar world. So the running theme of, of India's engagement and with the East was really, uh, how do we limit the power of the US uh, and the West? But now we're actually working with the US uh, explicitly uh, to, to define a new security order in the region. So when did this change take place? Uh, uh, is it taking place? I mean, I think it is a continuous process after Galwan. Or was it after Doklam in 2017? Uh, was it the creation of the Quad uh, or revival of the Quad? Was it the Indo-Pacific conception uh, that India finally embraced in 2018? Uh, I think all these form into a continuum. But the fact is, the rise of China, as, as Sri points out in his book, uh, and the challenges that it has posed to India, uh, we've seen uh, India reorient its position, a, a position today that is less hostile to the US, more open to security cooperation, not just bilaterally, but plurilaterally, which is what the Quad uh, is about, which we've not done before. Until recently, we used to think sitting in BRICS was progressive, but uh, sitting with the Americans was abandonment of independent foreign policy. The government seems to have resolved that, you know, that contradiction at least. No, it happily sits in both. But the fact is, what we do with the US uh, has dramatically increased. And how much the government might finesse it, uh, the centrality of it is really about balancing Chinese power. Uh, which uh, which uh, threatens India. I mean, there's no uh, escaping that. Having pointed to this principal change that has taken place, uh, I think the the next book uh, Sri and uh, you know Harsh might want to put together really has to look at I think five big changes that have taken place in this region. Uh, some of those were touched upon in this, uh, but some of those actually transcend the main arguments made in this book. Uh, for example, the 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 Sri's point about economic integration of growing free trade, et cetera, all that is true. But we're also seeing for a first time, a shadow being cast over the logic of globalization because till a few years ago, it was assumed the globalization was inevitable, ir irreversible uh, and ineluctable. Uh, but today I think the, the principal promoter of globalization, that is the United States, uh, has its pol policies have changed on trade uh, and on how it deals with the question of free trade and globalization. Similarly, China too, which has been the biggest beneficiary of globalization in this part of the world. When Xi Jinping talks about uh, dual circulation, uh, he's also beginning to emphasize a domestic component of the economy and trying to dissociate. I mean, well before the Americans started it, uh, the idea of creating uh, industrial policy, domestic strengths. So I think we are at a place while trade volumes might continue to rise for a while, the structure of globalization uh, is changing. Uh, and I think, and its impact, for example, on technology, when it comes to choices on 5G, on internet, and a whole range of issues today, we're going to see a lot more contestation uh, on, the, on the economic sphere, on the trade and technology domain. So it's not a simple economic integration, but th that itself is under contestation. Uh, so that is a, a new feature and how this plays out 
uh, uh, and so that that is something you would want to look at the next volume you take up. Second is the return of the great power rival. So when India began its look east policy, the assumption in the early 90s was, look, everybody was getting along with everyone. Americans and the Russians loved each other. China and America's partnership was at the highest. Uh, China and Russia had made up the differences. Japan, which was championing uh, China's entry into the global institutions, so the globalization of Chinese economy, largely driven by initially by Japanese investment. So you seem to be in this happy situation. Uh, no Cold War. Uh, everyone was getting along with everyone. Uh, history had come to an end. And, and that for India, it was simply a, just merely a question of just dealing with dealing with everyone at that point of time. And that situation has changed. Uh, the US-China rivalry, Japan-China rivalry, and India-China rivalry. Uh, those are real facts today. And these are going to play themselves out uh, in, a, in a significant way uh, in the years ahead. And uh, so it is not whether this is in contestation with economic integration, uh, that, that the both sides are trying to adapt the, the major powers to this new situation. But it's a region, how the region adapts to it is still a problem where I live now in Southeast Asia. Uh, they had such a great benefits from the US-China economic integration. Uh, today, the pressures on them to adapt to this, to deal with this are really new. And I think any uh, next research that we do into this, uh, we'll have to focus on how this region is struggling to come to terms with the breakdown of the US-China relationship for nearly 40 odd years. Uh, this was a, a positive integrating relationship. Uh, today, the trade has not collapsed. Uh, they, it will continue for some more time, but there are new rivalries uh, that, that are going to complicate the whole regional atmosphere. The third, I think, when we talk about China's rise, uh, I think Sri talked about this point. Uh, often, we, you know, in the romantic sense of Asia's rise, we frame China's rise as something that stands in opposition to the West. The China is now equal to the Americans. The East has risen to the, against the West. But the fact is China's rise has also altered the balance of power within Asia. It's not just the balance of power between US and the West or between China and the West, but it's all the internal balance of power in Asia has dramatically altered. Uh, China today, which was a smaller economy than Japan just a decade ago, is the biggest economy. Its military spending you know, is larger than what India and Japan, the two large neighbors can do together. So you're seeing about an internal shift in the balance of power within the East which puts China towering over the rest of the neighbors. And it is that power gap that gives China the freedom today to try and redeem uh, many of its historic uh, you know, claims on, on whether it is South China Sea, whether it is the, the Great Himalayan border. Uh, so this is a new situation. I mean, because all the romantic notions about Asia, Asian unity, Asian solidarity, I mean, I want to argue that out, but uh, it, was, it was always an illusion, I think, but the ASEAN-led uh, multilateralism seemed to suggest that there was this uh, Asian unity that had that had emerged, but now I think uh, you have actually uh, that unity uh, as uh, as come under stress, whether it is between China and Japan or between India and India and, uh, and China, or between Vietnam and China. So there are fault lines today within Asia. Uh, how they play out uh, is something uh, that is going to be uh, significant. On the new geography that she talked about, the Indo-Pacific, both Harsh also talked about it. In some ways, look, Indo-Pacific is not really a new geography. Uh, I'll just give you one example. I mean, if you go back to the Second World War, the Japanese had come right up to Burma. They'd occupied the Andaman Islands. They'd set up Shubhash Bose's uh, uh, no, provisional government of India. Uh, the Indian Army, working with the, that is the British Indian Army, working with the Americans and the British to support the Chinese Army against the Japanese occupation. Now, and Bay of Bengal, the Japanese were bombing Calcutta, Madras once in a while. Now, if that is not Indo-Pacific, that is you have the, act, the cast of characters, India, Indian Armed Forces, China, Nationalist China, uh, Imperial Japan, the US, Britain, these were the actors that were shaping this theater in 1943, 1944. Uh, what happened after that was we withdrew from this region from its security politics, from its economic politics, in the name of non-alignment and, uh, and economic self-reliance, we pulled out of this region. Uh, I, what the Lukis policy or the Actis policy uh, over the last 30 years was trying to reconnect to this region. And the, strong, the, the stronger India does, uh, one way of filling the Indo-Pacific happens. Although China is in any case coming into the Indian Ocean, uh, they're the point, I think, uh, that the Chinese uh, role in, in Indian Ocean is growing. So for this notion that these two seas were different, that is the recent construct. But if you go back to the Second World War, uh, Southeast Asia Command, 
when it was set up. It was set up in Kandy in Sri Lanka. Seattle, the member of Seattle is Pakistan. So this notion that South Asia is different from East Asia, Indian Ocean is different from the Pacific Ocean, was a consequence of the relative decline of South Asia and India uh, from the Asian politics. And today, as India comes back in and China rises, uh, you are going to have this geography. It does, it, I don't really matter what we call it, uh, but I think there is the, the expansion of the Chinese power and Indian attempt to counter it uh, through an Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, produce a new region uh, in that sense and a new set of equations. Finally, the last two points I want to mention. One is the uh, the ASEAN, uh, you know, probably had a great success when conditions were ripe for it. No great power rivalry. Uh, the, the, there's no other institution. So for them to lead a multilateral integration, institutional integration into the region. And India's own policy was one of trying to become part of ASEAN, uh, trying to be all be part of all its institutions. But today, of course, we pay obeisance uh, to ASEAN centrality. But the very fact that we, we're doing Quad, because nobody in ASEAN uh, accepts the notion that the Quad and will continue to support ASEAN, I think there's a lot of discom discomfort here, in, in, including in Singapore, uh, that whether Quad will undermine ASEAN. So that's not the real question. The question is, ASEAN is not good enough to deal with the security challenges. They can't even protect themselves against Chinese occupation. To expect them to save the region, uh, I think it's a is a is a far-fetched uh, thing. Second, I think that that uh, the security of this region, I think Americans have realized, it's not enough with a hub and spoke system. Is not enough to secure this region, and that India's participation in complementary institutions like the Quad has become a necessary new organizational principle to deal with the China's rise and the destabilized situation that has emerged in Asia. So, so these five things, the changes in economic globalization, the, 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 there is a new contestation on that, renewed great power rivalry, the destabilization of Asian balance of power, the emergence of new geography, and the emergence of new institutions. These are the new themes, I think, uh, uh, for us in India, the research communities, uh, IR communities, will have to deal with. And, and underlying that uh, is the point I made, that India is now in in partnership with the US and the West, as opposed to the last 100 years, where we were keeping our distance, sometimes mostly opposed to them. And this is a huge change. How this plays out, uh, the jury is out, but, but this is a different game. Uh, it's a different strategy that India has adopted. I'll stop here, Harsh. Uh, thank you, Raja. Um, uh, some, uh... A very interesting and I think relevant points in, 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 this, in particular with, uh, related to the, uh, what perhaps India's role can be or should be or potentially uh, can be uh, in the Indo Pacific. Uh, so I would, uh, you know, uh, just add one thing to this and then let uh, then we'll give Sri the floor to address some issues that have emerged from Professor Bhalla and Professor Rajan uh, before we take up some of the other questions that are there in the chat box. Uh, Shri, one thing that I that I thought was interesting in the way you know you have defined Indo-Pacific, you know, you say East and Southeast Asia. Uh, in, in I mean, of course, India's definition, official definition of Indo-Pacific, is much wider, right? So, the way you know, the shores of Africa, all the way to, to Oceania, and in that context, what you know, of course, uh, we have seen uh, India's recent Sinaki's policy is moving in a certain direction, but there has always been this concern in India about uh, this, this definitional aspect, because India does look at the Arabian Sea and what is happening in the Middle East, very, very important from that point of view. So, so if you're looking, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, uh, then you, then the way you define the Pacific, you know, is, is there a conceptual basis to it, or it, was it primarily about looking uh, at the Middle East and at East policy so as to derive some analysis about the wider? Um, you know, Indo-Pacific, uh, rather than just expanding it uh, and making it uh, much, much broader. And I think the other point that, that I think both uh, uh, Professor Mala and uh, Dr. Uh, Rajat Mohan mentioned, uh, if, if you can talk about that, because, you know, increasingly we are looking at this debate on national security and economic integration uh, being looked at slightly differently than in the past. Uh, we are looking at you know, the, 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 this idea that these are two sides of the same coin. So we will now trade with like-minded countries. In the past, the idea was that let's trade 
and make friends. Now we only want to trade with friends or now we only want to develop technologies with our friends. So I, you know, is this something uh, that will change uh, or, or in your assessment change some of the ideas in the book uh, which have been about the stark delimitation or demarcation between economic security uh, and uh, national security? Or do you think that this is something that eventually will resolve itself out uh, and eventually we will go back to some of the trends that we have seen over the last three decades in particular. So if you can briefly answer a few of these issues, then we, we, I think we have a few questions from the audience that we will be happy to do. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Bhala and Professor Rajmohan, and uh, uh, thanks, Harsh. Uh, let me just try to uh, address some of these points. Uh, as Professor Bhalla said, in most of the period uh, post World War, most of the Luke East was looking for economic relations, and it was not integrated with a strategic outlook. They were basically, uh, except for the Indo-ASEAN FTA, which dealt with ASEAN as a whole, basically it was bilateral, which is why this book is structured like that. Uh, and to uh, uh, so it, then it evolved, and as you were saying, now we are on the cusp of change, where. The economic and the strategic are being integrated, given China's uh, assertiveness, including on the India-China line of actual control and the events of the last one year. So we are seeing an integration, uh, as you said, you know, technology development, dependence on supply chains, all of that should be with quote-unquote friends, not with uh, opponents. So that is now security and economic, which was disengaged, is now getting re-engaged in Indian policy towards the uh, Towards the east, uh, and just to briefly address your other point that you know, uh, I defined it as East and Southeast Asia and East and of South Asia to make it manageable as a book. And because if you bring in uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, westwards, I mean, up to uh, the shores of Africa, the Gulf, you're engaging with a whole range of totally different set of issues. So we looked at it in terms of the Middle East and Act East policies and the coverage of those policies, and including. The bridging between South Asia and Southeast Asia brings check is a kind of bridge. So that's why we defined it in a more limited way rather than from the eastern shores of Africa all the way to the Pacific, uh, which would make it uh, sort of uh, less manageable, uh, less tractable. Uh, so, I mean, as Raja said, all the points, I mean, uh, that you raised, we are now seeing a, a great power rivalry between US and China is going to define the Indian uh, uh, look east or act east policy now. And it's, I, as I say in my opening chapter towards the later part, uh, basically uh, you can have three situations. One is that you have increased US dominance. I mean, the slowing China, China with slowing growth and greater political isolation, uh, the US becomes, remains dominant, becomes dominant if it is, completes the Obama rebalance of pivot towards uh, Pacific, I mean, 60% of aeronaval forces in the Pacific relative to the Atlantic. If all that happens, if the quad gels as more than just a consultative mechanism, then you're going to have uh, continued US dominance as the pr primary security provider in Asia, and that has its implications for India. The greater integration with the US, which started uh, you know, a decade, decade and a half back, and will continue. The second scenario is the status quo, where you have a world which is basically a consultative mechanism, it's not an alliance, it's not a formal coalition or containment mechanism. You will have India playing its cards uh, in different directions. I mean, you will have, uh, you know, continued relationship with Russia in some senses you, for, you know, supplies, I mean, uh, you know, uh, leasing nuclear submarine, other things, uh, weapon supply, you will have uh, your diversification of options, which is the multi-alignment you're seeing under the Modi government. So if the status quo continues. The third scenario is if you have a narrowing of the gap between China and the US steadily in the next 10 to 15 years, in the sense that as uh, China, even a slowing China growing at, say, 6% or so, will be growing faster than the US, the GDP gap will grow, the GDP gap will narrow from about 65% of US GDP to maybe 80% or as some predict forecasts say that by 2030, 2035, Chinese GDP will overtake or catch up with the US. If that happens, then 
I think the implications for Indian policy will be tough. And within that scenario, there are two scenarios. One is the US will, under whichever administration, make an intensified bid to contain China, including bring in India, bring in other countries, and a highly confrontational situation will develop. Second sub scenario is the US sort of quote unquote gives up and accommodates China on increasingly Chinese terms as the Chinese economy catches up. And it also means the Chinese will bulk larger in the economy's trade profiles of the rest of the Asia, making it deterring them from sort of aligning against China. If that happens, if the GDP growth, if the GDP gap narrows and Chinese power increases relatively, then the quad may actually become dysfunctional. And then for India, that will be a not a happy scenario. It will have to face a China which is quote unquote accommodated by the US, maybe in 10 years from now, and a Chinese dominant Asia, which is not a happy scenario for India and for a whole range of other countries. So I see these three scenarios uh, as possibilities in the next 10 years, depending upon relative growth rates, depending upon political will and the case of the US. Uh, which will determine Indian policies to a large extent. Hope I've been able to address some of the uh, questions. Thanks, Sri. Let me hand this over to Insia now for uh, so that we can take some questions from your audience. Insia, over to you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, the first uh, question is from Behbhav Singh. Um, apart from a huge market, what can India offer to the Indo Pacific? China has market products as well as capital to offer. So is India's USP for the region only as a balance to China so that the threat of joining the Indian camp would help them get better terms and deals from China? Uh, shall I take a few questions first? I mean, uh, I like three or four. Sure, sure. Um, uh, another question is, uh, when when was this presumption of the romantic idea of Asian unity conceptualized? And uh, another one is, um, is there any relevance of the ASEAN given the destabilized situation in Asia? Uh, okay, let me just try to answer these two. I mean, yeah, all the uh, you know Asian countries, as I see it, Raja will be able to uh, say, I mean, from his uh, position in Singapore, be much more of exactly what's going on. So will Professor Bhalla, as an expert on China, but all the various Asian countries, whether it's Vietnam, whether it is, uh, you know, Myanmar, they are playing a sort of balancing game of trying to, uh, they're negotiating with China. And if you have a country like India, which is able to offer some things, it helps them then bargaining power. They're not totally dependent on one power, one source, uh, so it helps the bargaining part. So there is multiple bargaining games going on in Asia. Uh, and uh, so India is sort of uh, something they can, uh, you know, possibly rely on to some extent for some kinds of uh, inputs or supplies or as an alternative market. So in their bargaining with the uh, increasingly economically dominant part in Asia, there is that. Uh, so there, uh, I mean, uh, India holds some cards, but not a very strong hand in terms of uh, as an economic counterweight to China so, so far. Uh, the other thing is that uh, ASEAN has been fairly successful uh, as a, a economic uh, integrated area in the, with all the FTAs in the last two, two and a half decades and uh, intra-regional trade and investment and intra-regional uh, integration into supply chains, into global supply chains. But politically, it has not become, uh, and strategically, it is, as uh, Raja said, not being able to, uh, they can't really defend themselves. They're, they are increasingly looking to outside powers, whether it is the US alone or whether it is the Quad or whatever. And they also have discomforts with that because of their economic integration with China. So uh, a fluid situation. We are in a state of flux at the moment where various scenarios are possible. Uh, ASEAN is not going to be an effective uh, defense mechanism. Uh, it will. It is a fairly... Uh, uh, it is also 
looking at alternatives about, uh, you know, depending, uh, it's afraid of Chinese uh, assertiveness in the South China Sea especially. But it is not able to, on its own, do much about it. It is looking to the US, to the Quad, and so on. So, I mean, that's how I'm, from here, I'm, as, as, as an observer from here, I'm seeing it. Uh, then I don't think Asian unity was a romantic notion. I mean, it didn't come up, it came about through practical needs. Uh, it, I mean, uh, intra regional trade and integration uh, came about through practical needs, not that somebody had a romantic idea of Asian unity. Uh, I, so, uh, 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 and it was essentially, ASEAN was formed in the context of the Cold War, 1967, as a non communist grouping to resist what was seen as communist uh, thrust by the communist past. So uh, it was all uh, practical economic and strategic needs which uh, led to a sort of uh, integration in ASEAN and uh, around it. Uh, not any sort of romantic Asian versus West kind of thinking. Professor Bala, Dr. Professor Bala, I think I see them. Okay, you know, on the on the centrality of ASEAN and the the um, the significance of ASEAN today, uh, there's a lot of lip service today to the centrality of ASEAN, but I think with the RCEP. Uh, really effectively and in practical terms, ASEAN is not marginalized, but it has been co-opted into the China-driven institutions. Uh, so while ASEAN may want to keep saying it is you know, very central to how uh, Southeast Asia organizes itself or East Asia organizes itself, um, I think the, the heyday of ASEAN is actually past. That's one. Uh, secondly, on the romanticism of uh, Asian unity, I think when the idea of Asian unity was first suggested, and we really uh, look at it in terms of uh, our immediate pre and post independence period, the world was in turmoil. And I think most Asian states, Afro Asian states or Asian states uh, particularly, were beginning to look for identity creating concepts. So I, I think we shouldn't actually dismiss that um, experience that Asian states had. And it wasn't actually romantic. I think they were quite clear about their national interests. They were states in the making. Uh, they were very clear what the national interests were. They were very clear that they were not going to merge into a, some kind of a core prosperity sphere or into a larger Asian uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, architecture or, or institution. Um, but it was hardly romantic. I think it was extremely practical, extremely, in a sense, um, you know, allowed Asian states to define for themselves what they were going to be and how in contradistinction to their old colonial status. So I, I think it's very, it's very apt today to say that Nehruvian ideas were, uh, you know, were, were uh, emotional or they were, uh, you know, idealistic. But I do think we tend to forget there was a historical point at which these things emerged. And for that point, they were really actually pretty adequate ideas that defined for many, many people living in Asian countries what they were all about and where they were going to go. It may never have come to any kind of fruition eventually. Obviously, we know the end of Bandung, we know the end of non-alignment and all the rest of it. But for that moment, in the late 1940s and the early 1950s, it was an idea that energized Asian nations. So, you know, idealistic, I'm not sure that we use it. We, I mean, one needs to use that term in terms of, uh, you know, with hindsight, um, I think without looking at that historical moment. Uh, you know, and, and the, well, that's it, that's it. That's what I want to say really, okay. We differ from both uh, Madhu and uh, Sri that look, I mean, a nationism was a concept. I mean, I mean, I'm not going into explaining what led to it. And pan nationism, uh, if you want to go back to Okakura Tenshin, I mean, his famous book, Ideals of the East, 
uh, the first sentence is a dramatic one. If you ever write a book, you should have a first sentence like that. The first sentence is three words. Asia is one. Asia is the first sentence of this book. And you're talking about the 1910s. Uh, as, as the resistance against colonialism began, I mean, there was a sense that, look, we are different. We have a culture of our own. We have a past. Uh, we, are, we, have been, we had great times before. So therefore, we have an identity of our own. So that was construction of Asian identity. Uh, so same was similarly pan-Islamism also emerged around the same time. There was pan-Arabism later, pan-third worldism. You had all these movements that came in, but all of them ran into one problem. You know, how do you reconcile uh, the pan-Asian movement or pan-Islamic movement uh, with the construction of nation states? How you deal with your internal problems? So, so I think it was a struggle. I mean, so as far as the pan-Asian uh, history is concerned, is well documented going back to tension in Tagore, you have the Japanese use of it uh, literally uh, for their own imperial purposes, the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Uh, then you had the Asian Relations Conference, you had the Bandung meeting, which then morphed into Afro-Asian and then into an online. So it's a long story. And, and uh, if, as, as recently, those of you who read Kishore Mahbubani, the Asia is rising, Asian values, Asia will stand up against the West. So these ideas have been pretty strong. And, uh, and I think today China says that, that Asia for Asians, uh, Americans should get out. Uh, that again uh, is, a, is a slogan Japanese had used in the past. So I think the problem, you know, you can argue on whether it is idealistic. I, I'm barely saying uh, the, these, the Pan-Asian movement struggled to come to terms with the balance of power, uh, with collaboration, with boundary disputes with dealing with minority problems. Uh, those are real. I mean, I think those, those exist today. And those have sharpened today between China and Japan, between India and, Jap India and China, uh, between China and Vietnam, as Chinese power asserts itself. You can't fix this with the talk about Asian unity. And I think that's part of the problem for ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN does not have the power to contest the Chinese power. Forget they're doing for the region. Uh, when Vietnamese territory or the Filipinos territory is being taken by China, there's not much ASEAN can do. So it's not a question of blaming them, uh, but it is a question of power equations out there. So they have a problem. So at the same time, they're so tied into the Chinese economy that they can't be seen as siding with the Americans. So they have a problem. It's dependent on China. We didn't want to be seen with the Americans till recently. We said, no, 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 we're never going to be aligned. We'd always uh, stand with the Chinese. So, you know, we are sitting in bricks and bricks and or whatever in Shanghai cooperation organization. We continue to say that. So for smaller countries is even a bigger problem of how do you deal with the Chinese power? And in a period of deep economic integration uh, with China that has already taken place. So in terms of the uh, alternatives that are being given, I mean, uh, India, you know, look, India is not comparable in size. It, today's uh, Chinese economy is five times larger than India. So even on market, uh, we're not there in comp competing with them. On trade, we walked away from our set. So there are a lot of disappointment in the ASEAN that India, uh, which came with the promise of integrating, uh, today has taken a different approach to trade and globalization. Uh, talks about self-reliance. Uh, you know, we don't have to get into the debate. So there is a disappointment uh, in, in ASEAN that India's market, uh, is it going to be open? Is it going to be closed? Those issues are being debated. And, and Australia are talking about constructing resilient supply chains. Post completely rely on China. They need to build some alternative uh, framework where you know, production, some sensitive areas, which can be moved out, pharmaceuticals, for example, uh, high technology items. So there's stock. I mean, there's nothing, not much action so far. But this idea, you need to build alternative uh, integration uh, to China is there. Uh, similarly, on infrastructure, there again, there is talk about G7 is talking about something. India does it in its little bit in its own region. We are nowhere in competition with China. Australia. Japan has a big, big partnership of quality infrastructure. The idea that these can be all pooled to compete with China, I mean, it's still uh, difficult to do those, that kind of a thing, but nevertheless, some ideas are there. But at this point, there's no real alternative to BRI in that sense, but there are individual projects in different places uh, that are being offered uh, as, a, as an alternative. On this, yes, uh, you can do some, India can do some, and India needs to work with others in providing some balance. So India is not capable of providing the balance on its own. So central change, I mean, which is what I tried to highlight, the partnership with the US and its Asian allies stayed away from for 100 years. We are working with them today. 
know, forget what the government says about we are not aligned, this is we are multi-aligned. You know, as analysts, we got to see that India has no choice but to balance Chinese power. And America is probably at this point, there's no other alternative to working with the United States to balance Chinese power. You know, that is a stark reality. As analysts, we must see how Delhi is adapting to that. Uh, so adaptation is going on. Uh, forget that, you know, finessing it at the top, but, but I think on the fundamental level, uh, we're doing things with the Americans, which we've never done before, on the military side, on the economic side, and some of the new agenda that Quad has identified. So th there is, here it is, a, a radically different way of dealing with the East. West, I mean, West, I mean, colloquially, just for the US, uh, essentially. Uh, so this is a new element of India's Indo-Pacific strategy. And I think this is what, uh, how this plays out, uh, I think uh, should be the one we, we should be debating in greater detail uh, in, the, in the coming years. See, I, I, I think uh, we are running out of time now, right? Yeah, sure. But we have time for one more question, if that is okay with you. Uh, it's, uh, it's from Udeb Hanu Singh. Uh, India has opted out of RCEP and India has not put enough of a budget for the Navy. How will developments in Afghanistan and the pandemic impact our move to the East? I mean, uh, but I would uh, really, I mean, Madhu does the economic stuff, you know, knows much more. I won't get into the, the RCEP trade related issues, but I would say the Navy's budget, yes, that's a critical question. I mean, as uh, India's uh, maritime ambitions and the Indo-Pacific framework comes, we need to do more with the Navy. And given the problems we have with the Chinese and the Pakistanis, and now in Afghanistan, the continental pressures continue to focus on building the army, strengthening the land defense rather than the maritime defense. So the one solution for this uh, is really what uh, is happening, uh, which is you work with your friends or create new partners. And that's why the naval partnership with the US becomes so important, uh, US, Japan, and Australia, and whoever we can get into that coalition. Therefore, uh, India, India's, in absolute terms, India's naval resources are not limited. They're fairly significant relative to the others. But the scale of the cha challenge we're going to confront from China means we have to work with others. So we have to work in coalitions. That the Chinese power is imposing on India's traditional non-aligned, go it alone, lone ranger approach and that building coalitions. And that's what the Quad is about, essentially focused on the maritime domain, uh, working in naval and maritime coalitions uh, with, the, with the partners. I think on the RCEP, can I come in on that? Yeah, on the RCEP, uh, you know, India sort of got cold feet. Right, it was there right to the last moment, and at the last moment, it decided that you know there was too much economic pain for it to go ahead with the RCEP. Uh, I think India has been more adventurous when it was economically just beginning to liberalize. The look east policy was, at, uh, you know, in which it actually sought e economic integration. It entered into conversations uh, with ASEAN. It signed uh, bilateral uh, treaties with ASEAN states. Um, it was much more outgoing. It was much more willing to take certain risks about opening up its economy. I think today we are somewhat ambivalent about where we want to go on our economy. Are we going to be Atman Hitler? Are we going to, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, retreat from globalization? Are we going to actually integrate? What is it that we exactly want to do? And I think the the the, the fallout of the RCEP. Um, will actually be, as, as, as Raja said, you know, the, the ASEAN states are saying what Southeast Asia is saying, what's happening here? Are you not integrating? Do you want to integrate or you don't want to integrate? So really, we have to look at our domestic economy and see how we can, on which sectors and on what conditions we actually can open up, take some economic pain and yet integrate for a larger, for a longer term view of economic integration. I think we have lost that sense of a longer term sense of integration. We need to recapture this to some extent, but also we need to do something domestically within our various sectors to be able to shore up, give ourselves a confidence to be able to economically integrate going forward. But I think there's another thing with the economy. I think it's not so much 
much about trade and investments anymore. It's also about how the future of our economy is going to look. It's about technology. It's about innovation. It's about the new sectors of technology that are going to be central to economic growth. So in many ways, I think, um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the government of India, um, whether it's fact, obviously it's factoring all of these things in, but whether that was one of the things in the RCEP decisions or not. Um, but really, uh, in a sense, uh, just focusing on trade and investment may not be the, uh, the, the whole story. And so therefore, if India can, while not being a part of RCEP, look at these other aspects of economic growth and the future of the economy, then perhaps it will not lose out that much from not being part of the RCEP, because technology and technological exchange and innovation, I think, with the largest uh, global technology technological power, if you have a better de if you have a better relationship with the United States, you tend to gain a great deal more in these areas from that association. So maybe the RCEP may not be that much of a loss if you don't actually focus just on trade and investment. That's it. Just one more question, which was just, with, just, I mean, on the, I, I think, uh, like on the security policy, our attitude to the U.S. has profoundly changed and changed our policy. I think under the BJP government, there is a fundamental shift in the attitude to trade. Domestic industrialization, building domestic capabilities, and not in the form that Indira Gandhi did in, you know, which, which is really, you know, you shut down domestic capital, you shut out foreign capital to one of actually strengthening the domestic capital, unleashing domestic capital, of creating domestic capabilities. So I think this is a fundamentally different strategy than what we pursued from the early 90s, which took us, you know, emulate ASEAN, reduce your tariffs, be, join all the free trade agreements, to one now which says, no, uh, we're going to you know, create domestic capabilities. And in fact, the pandemic has shown the importance of creating national capabilities. And in that sense, probably we are not very very far from China or the US, both of whom are thinking about globalization uh, in, in new ways, uh, but then that, that will create short-term problems on, on a range of issues, whether we have the capacity to manage those uh, while, uh, while you have a different domestic uh, strategy towards industrialization, uh, can you still be part of a capital trade flows, which is that's where the emphasis today, what Harsh pointed out, a trade with EU, a trade with UK, doing those if at least with someone we should be able to do free trade agreements and if you can't do it complementary you know similar economies like in east asia can you do it at least with west and some other countries but at this point uh, we still have to see that progress with somewhere or the other where india does some way of expanding its trade footprint uh, beyond uh, asia i think that is a that is the challenge we, we're going to see uh, thanks, Rajar. Ishri, the, the last word is yours before I hand it over to Insia. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, uh, this book actually uh, gives the entire background in the last 30 years since the early uh, Lukey's policy started with each and every major country in the region. I mean, so it provides the, uh, the sort of basis for uh, addressing all the questions which have arisen in the discussion going forward. Uh, in, in, one, in one volume, you can get the entire India's uh, policies, options, and roles towards a whole range of Asian countries and in this entire Indo Pacific region in one volume, which then will be the, can be the foundation for a whole range of further questions and analysis of going forward. So, with that, I mean, the, uh, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, both Professor Bhalla and uh, uh, Ra Professor Rajamohan and yourself and OBS for uh, this uh, event. And thank you uh, all the contributors to the book uh, and uh, everybody else who made time to attend this event. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Professor Shridharan. Uh, Professor Pant, Professor Bhalla, Professor Rajamohan and Professor Shridharan. Thank you so much for that insightful and informative discussion. I thank my colleagues at Orion Black Swan who have been involved in today's event. To all members of the audience who have joined us today and to those of you watching live on YouTube, a very big thank you. We do hope you enjoyed the discussion. The volume edited by Professor T. Sridharan, Eastward Ho, India's relation with the Indo-Pacific is available at orientblackswan.com and on Amazon. 
Thank you once again for joining us. We wish you a pleasant evening. Take care and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all.